Uh, I'm going to start in at the end of Acts 12. This is an interesting transition we begin to make here in Acts 12 in, in a... Um, It begins what is labeled as Paul's first missionary journey. Labeled that for, you know, there's already been all sorts of missionary journeys going on locally, more locally. There's already, and there's also more than Paul involved in this missionary journey. But for the for, for simplicity's sake, we like to label this Paul's first missionary journey. Uh, and it is certainly, uh, at, as as it begins, it begins as, as two co-leaders, and as we as we go through, you actually see it transition into where Paul becomes the leader of the of the party, and so it's an interesting transition, and in, in the fallout from that, and the in the various um, just a lot lot going on. So let's let's open up real quick, uh, and I'm going to read, and then we'll pray. Uh, start off in 1224. But the word of the Lord grew and multiplied, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry, and they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. Okay, so this is, uh, let me just read through first. We'll talk about that in a minute. Surname Mark. Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they, they sent them away. So, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived to Salimus, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. Now when they had gone through the island to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a prophet, a Jew whose, whose name was Barjesus, who was with proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for this man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for so his name was translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O oh, fool of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Now when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John departed from them, returning to Jerusalem. Let's pray. Father, uh, I thank you, God, for your word. I thank you, Lord, for these men. Thank you, God, for um, the blessing we have, Lord, to sit here in freedom, to open up your word, to, to dig in, to discuss, to pray, to lift up your name. God, let us not take that as um, lightly, but God, to use it, redeeming the time that we have to do this freely. God, give us a, a desire to be in your word, Lord. Forgive, uh, forgive me, God, that... I don't take the time as often as I should, God, to, to dig in and to, to seek after you. God, I thank you for these men, Lord. I, I, I pray, God, that you um, help them, Lord, to, to give you their burden tonight. Lord, that uh, they will be refreshed, 
that they'll remember, God, that it's you who does the work. God, I pray, Lord, you help me to get out of your way. Lord, that you would teach us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Um, So like I was saying, we see an interesting transition here. Um, the, the Holy Spirit was given in Acts 1.8 or the declaration of the Holy Spirit by, by the Lord that you will receive, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and she, you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Um, interesting. I just noticed something. We'll get that when we get there. But anyway, there, so up until this point, you have, before I get started there, how, how do you read that verse? How do you read that? And it, I was listening to John Corson I was, how I was, while I was uh, preparing for this. He made an interesting point because I think I tend to read that as you shall be witnesses to me, as in go do this thing, rather than a prophetic, hey, guys, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit, and you will be. He's not saying, yes, this is a command. Yes, this is a, something we should have a burden to do. But it's also Jesus saying, I'm giving you the power. I'm, giving, I'm sending the Holy Spirit to empower you. I'm doing the work. I'm doing the heavy lifting, and you guys are going to get to be witnesses to me. You guys get to take part in this this witnessing, not just to your little town, to your little city, but to the the bigger area, to the state, to the and to the ends of the earth. You get to be a part of this, and I, and I, for me, that's just refreshing to think of it that way. Yes, He is our Lord, and He gives us commands, and we should we should follow and obey. But He's also prophetic and sees down the road understanding what he's already given us understanding what he's already given them he said you guys are going to get to do this you guys are going to be be able to take part in this and so as we have walked through the first 12 chapters we've watched this unfold they've the in in uh 528 they were accused of filling jerusalem with the, with this doctrine right so this is the first th- so they they've been spreading the word they've been uh, persecuted, and yet they continue to, to talk. They continue to, to be the witnesses. Um, in six, six, seven, the word spread, and the disciples multiplied greatly. Again, this is in Jerusalem. So you see that is in Jerusalem. This has already happened. Interesting. I, I, I combined Judea and Samaria in here, and it's interesting as you as you look at this in here, they're actually combined together. But the reason I combined them is that Judea and Samaria kind of started being reached. Once it spread out of Jerusalem, they kind of started being reached at the same time. They, they, it, it got larger, and it just kind of, kind of got larger. So I thought that was interesting that as I read this, those are bunched together in here as well. But 8.1, Saul scattered them throughout Judea. So this is Saul persecuting the church. This is the future Paul. He is already Paul at this point, but going by the name of Saul. He's scattering them. He's, he is persecuting the church causing it to grow. 825, they preached the gospel in many villages. 826, Philip, with the eunuchs down in Gaza, he was sent, this eunuch heading heading back down to uh, Africa, Philip runs down to Gaza, preaches the gospel to him, opens up the scriptures to him, and he becomes saved and baptized. Now he's heading down to to share what he just learned, what what he just received. 840, after Philip... uh, converted the eunuch Philip preached to all the cities till he came to Caesarea so Philip again moving around preaching different areas so so we see this this growing of the gospel and then we get to 13 and we we see the first sort of the sort of the hey let's the first one we're we're aware of necessarily hey let's let's go on a, let's go do this thing God is the Holy Spirit has uh has called them They've been, had hands laid on, they're being sent. And that's where we kick off here real quick. And verse 1. Uh, get back to the right chapter. 
I'm going to go back to 24 real quick first, 12, 24. But the word of God grew and multiplied, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry, and they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. Remember, the mission they went on here is coming from back in end of 11, when, they, when the um, disciples, each according to his own ability, they, they, because the, the church in Jerusalem was not doing well financially, the people were... They, they were struggling. They didn't have uh, what they needed to survive. So they t- determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. This they also did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So we leave off. They were missing for chapter 12. They come back at the end of chapter 12 here, back from their mission. And that's where we, that's where we are. And here's what, here's what they find back in Antioch. Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets thing to remember here is, is it's you think of a small triple i mean antioch and jerusalem are really not that far away but that's driving that's you know this many week trip probably for them to get there and back so there's been there's been time for stuff to actually happen in antioch since they left now in the church that was at antioch there were certain prophets and teachers notice they separate those two there were certain prophets and teachers. Not all prophets are teachers. Not all teachers are prophets. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manain, Manain, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Interesting group of characters that we're introduced to here. Um, you have Barnabas. Name so His name was actually Joseph. He was named Barnabas by the uh, by the apostles, and he was a, you know, which means son of encouragement or son of, son of consul or you know, he's he's a, he's an encourager. He lifts people up. He he comes around others and lifts them up, and this is who he is. And so, then we have Simeon. He was a, uh, a black man out of the area which we now, call Nigeria. Um, uh, he was. Very likely, many people believe he was the one who helped Christ carry the cross. So. Um, Lucius of Cyrene. Cyrene is oh, actually. I was going to bring up a slide here. Um, to give an idea of where these dif- where these things are, uh, you see Antioch up here. The first Antioch we're talking. About. You actually hear about two Antiochs in thirteen. This is the first. That's the second. So here's the missionary trip that he's going on. It's about fifteen hundred miles by boat and land. Uh, the, the part we're covering today, actually the part we're covering in 13 is about um, 750 though, as they get up here to Iconium. Um, so here's Antioch, Seleucia down here, about 15 miles down, down to where there's a port, so they come over here to Selena. Um, Cyrene is actually not labeled on the map, it's kind of right here, it's the northern tip of Africa. Um, Gaza, where we mentioned down here. Places that we mentioned, Tarsus, Saul. Okay, I think that's all we've mentioned at this point. Okay, so um, it's an interesting group of people we have. There are Lucius of Cyrene down here. Then we have uh, Manain, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. Herod the Tetrarch was the the Herod when we talked about a couple weeks ago. There's lots of Herods. There's he, this was the the Herod that cut off John the Baptist's head, who mocked Jesus. This was that, that Herod. So he was, um, had been brought up with. He, foster brother is kind of how the, the Greek word is translated. He, was, he lived in their house. He was part of that family and that wealth. And, that, and it's interesting to see these two people brought up in the same opulence, brought up in the same splendor. And they went, one was called to, to follow Christ and the other uh, when it went a different direction. And, and interesting, we see that, that, that there was almost a heart in Herod towards finding out what John the Baptist said, towards, towards thinking about the things of Christ. But, but then he got too busy partying and drinking and got himself caught into a stupid situation. And uh, stupid situations, stupid decisions have major life implications, do they not? Manaim, who was brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. 
all these people from around this area coming together in Antioch. Uh, this is Antioch is again where where people were for, first called Christians. This was burgeoning center of of, um, of Christianity of, of Gentile Gentiles following Christ. And so so here we are, uh, Paul and Barnabas, who we'll see later. They they are beginning to be separated for that ministry. I think they're here, strangely enough, instead of in Jerusalem. They're here for a reason. I think the Lord has already begin, began to burden them towards who they're supposed to be uh, set apart for, to, towards reaching the Gentiles, towards calling them out. And it's, it's, a, it's a blessing here, if you notice. You have rich, you have poor, you have highly educated in Paul, you, you have um, different races, you have Gentiles, you have Jews, you have vastly different uh, emotional type people, uh, personalities as in Saul and Barnabas, vastly different, and yet the Lord has brought them together for, for a, a single purpose and to use them together in unity here. Uh, and I think that's a, something that we should, um, should not take lightly, that is, that is different about the, about the Church of Christ, that the world we see right now is trying to replicate that and forcing people together of different cultures and whatnot, and it's starting to explode as we see, whereas in, in Christ, we can be in fellowship and unity with people who are different than us in Christ. But, but when the world tries to do it, it forces and, and it doesn't, it rubs wrong and it blows up as we're seeing what's happening across the nation right now. And so this is no small thing. This is a blessing. This is something, if we look, if we look in our congregation on a Sunday morning, that, this is a blessing. This is, this is because the gospel is lifted up. This is because the word of God and Jesus are exalted here rather than a people group, rather than a certain culture, rather than, and that's, that's a blessing. And we, when, we, when that happens... God will bring all people, his people to him, no matter what they look like, talk like, sound like. Uh, so that's, this, this is no small thing that, the, that, that separates the church of Christ from the world, is that, that people of different backgrounds can be together in love. Uh, Paul, Paul and Barnabas, just said, as an example, are very, very, very different people. Paul was kind of like, I don't think he would have been a pleasant guy to know, to be honest. If <laughs> just reading scripture, he seems like he was just, I don't know how many type A, I've run into several type A type of guys, and, and they're, they're different. You know, they're, they're different birds. They, you know, I'm going to go do this, I'm going to run through a wall to get it done, whatever. And, and, that's, and we need those. We need, we need people who are doers that get things done, because all of us are not built that way. And, and if it, and, but the other thing side, if all of us were built that way, oh my gosh, whoo, that would be a painful, <laughs> painful world if all of us were built that way, right? So praise the Lord that he built us differently. Barnabas, on the other hand, is much more empathetic towards people. He, he's, a, he's an encourager. He looks at people and, and he sees, sees their need, empathizes with their pain, and encourages them and brings them up, up in ministry. And we uh, we, we, we'll we see some differences as, as we go here. Um, life lesson being, whoop, that's not the right place. God gifts e each man differently and uses those gifts to accomplish his purposes. God gifts each man differently and uses those gifts to accomplish his purposes. That seems, duh, but that's not so duh in, in practicality and reality when the rubber meets the road. God, God didn't gift me or call me to do what Pastor Dave is doing. He didn't gift many of us. He, he didn't gift me to stand up with a guitar. He didn't gift me to do various things. He, and vice versa. I, I'm gifted in certain areas that other people aren't gifted aren't gifted in and so he needs each one of us he wants each one of us and we'll see here with with Paul and Barnabas there's a special bond here between them that I don't I don't know if we would have had one without the other they Barnabas came along and blessed Paul and encouraged him when everybody else was like me and yet and then Paul later later in ministry he corrected and rebuked Barnabas when he was slipping into uh, uh, legalism with Peter and so we don't know what, what would have happened. They, 
Paul was very serious about the truth and very serious about the gospel and very, you know, didn't go one way or the other, didn't mince words. He was, he was a hard man. We needed that. But, but also, Barnabas was needed to encourage Paul and Barnabas was needed to encourage other people. And, and they, I think God sent them in ministry together on purpose. It wasn't like, hmm, here's two dudes. No, these, he designed, here's, here's two guys he designed together to do this. God gifts each man differently and uses those gifts to accomplish his purposes. Verses 2, verse 2, as they ministered to the Lord, as they ministered to the Lord, this isn't talking about ministering to other people, this isn't talking about serving other people, this is as they ministered to the Lord. What does that look like? What does that look like in your life, ministering to the Lord? Yes, we do serve other people at, on behalf of the Lord. But this is not what that's talking about. This is not talking about serving others. This is talking about worship and praise and fasting and prayer and a, and a time spent glorifying the Lord together in a group. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. How did the Holy Spirit talk to them? Was it a verbal, oh, we don't, we don't know, I don't think. But it's interesting that prior to that, it calls out certain prophets. <laughs> certain prophets were among them. And, you know, it, on top of that, as, as they're praying and as they're sharing while they minister to the Lord, could very, very well be that the Lord just prompted somebody to say something. Who knows what it was they said. Uh, it seems to be pretty clear here. So, so it could have been a very, very clear, hey, Paul and Barnabas, Holy Spirit said go. Could have also been that person didn't necessarily know that they, they just... The Lord had put something on their heart to share, and Paul and Barnabas received it as. And that's, that's an example of that with um, Pastor D.A. Is, is several years ago, I was, I was teaching at a, at a um, men's retreat at the camping trip, if you guys remember that camping trip by the river there. And um, I, I don't recall what I said or even what he's tried to, he shared it with me before but I don't remember ever saying it but at that point that was what the point when he was called he said that it, that the Lord had took what I said that I had no idea had anything to do with DA or but that was the point where DA was like it's time for me to go and that was two years ago it's been it's so it's he's worked into that so this this could certainly be somebody that they didn't necessarily know that they said it and so why I'm saying this is be aware when the Lord prompts you to say something. Be, be listening to the Spirit when He's called you to, to speak, when He's called you, and, and you need to be atu- in tune with the, the Holy Spirit and, and speaking what He wants you to say. Couched in Scripture, we need to make sure we're in the Word so we're not just, hey, here's some garbage. <laughs> I had this thought. I got a word from the Lord. <laughs> we obviously... <laughs> That's right. So... Obviously, uh, being being in the Word, so test it, test every spirit. Okay. Verse five, and when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and also had John as their assistant. Ooh, let me get that get that picture back up real quick. So they came out here to Seleucia. places so hey I know these people I know these places let's go there uh, it's interesting later on in 13 at, after the word was read after, after the law um, was read they say hey do you guys have something to say 
to Paul and Barnabas. That was, that's a weird thing. If you just show up in a church and don't know anybody and somebody calls you to say, hey, you want to say something? Probably not. It's probably based on connections that Barnabas had. If you think about the fact that, that uh, Barnabas enabled that, that ministry to begin based on who we know there and, and based on the fact that they trusted him. They, this was probably, this is conjecture a little bit, I, I understand, but they probably trusted him and therefore these people who came, you know, from from across, you know, came from Antioch, hey, sure, come up, stand up, what do, you, what do you have to say? We'll see later in 13, and so that's probably based on um, the relationships that Barnabas had previously. And John, at the end of that verse, they also had John as their assistant. This is John, the same John Mark that, that is called out up here in 25. He is the one who wrote the book of Mark. Um, he begins it. He he has an interesting um, relationship and dynamic between Barnabas and Saul, and, and it's uh, you'll see it through Scripture, and you'll we'll see in fifteen later. And I don't want to take take much away from 15, whoever teaches fifteen, but um, I, I think he's a young believer at this point. He's he's probably a young man, probably a young believer. He's coming along as an assistant. Uh, th this term here, assistant, uh, I'm not going to say the Greek because I'm not that dude. Uh, I'm sure Mr. Steve has it, but yeah. Yeah, and it, and it is a, uh, it literally the literal term for that word, or the little translation for that word is under rower. And so we have, uh, what, what does that mean? That these type of ships that had, you're, you're down here, you're cranking away, that's your job. You're the assistant. You're not calling the shots. You're not looking where we should go. You're not looking out for anything. You just... You're just pulling on the oars. <laughs> that's that's your job. That's what the Lord is, is is calling you to do, and that's and that's what the Lord had called John at this point. He was faithful in this little thing, and he was faithful in other things. And the Lord used him to write the book of the Bible. But at this point, John's job was not to ask questions. John's job was not to 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 look at whoever was leading and say, "That's a dumb idea." I would do so much better if I were in charge. His job is to pull on the oar. Just, just keep pulling. Yes, John, go get the tickets for the, for the trip. John, could you move the bag here? John, could you, you know, this was John's job. Just, just pulling on the oar. And the reality is, in, in most of our our lives and most of the cir circles that we run in, that's going to be our job. Our job is to pull on the oar. And we get the we get the impression that we're always the captain you know <laughs> and it's hard to be captain when you're supposed to be pulling on the oar and you're under the ship and you're man <laughs> really I really want to go over there but you don't know what over there looks like you're inside the ship that we're our job is to pull on the oar most of the time and so it's good good to remember that okay life lesson here if you do not assist well you will never lead well if you do not assist well you will no, never lead well um, us as men many of us our home will be possibly the only place where we're captain and if if we're if we haven't figured out how to assist other people without asking a million questions without criticizing every move they make without we're not going to be a very good leader in our own home because we're not going to know what it's like to have to follow we're going to we're always going to assume we're the captain so we need to humble ourselves um, some might ca call this being a backseat driver we have it are, are you a good under rower or are you that backseat driver do you do you always have no you shouldn't go that well you're going too fast no it's too bumpy on this road go on a different road just row just row. All 
All right, verse 6 and 8. Get back to where we were. Now when they had gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus. Here, here they came through here, 100 miles here, roughly. They went throughout Cyprus. So they probably didn't just run back and forth, hit, hit all the towns they could find, preaching the gospel, um, talking to people. They, they generated much interest in the word. And now when they had gone through the island to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul. The proconsul is like a, a governor of a region. A proconsul, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, this is probably the Greek name for Bar-Jesus, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Just a note here that that the proconsul sought the word of the Lord. There was resistance to that. There's all there's there was demonic resistance to that. He's a sorcerer. That's that's going to be in each one of our daily walks. It may not be a dude named Elymas. It may not even be a dude at all. Maybe circumstances, thoughts, distractions on your computer. But they're, they're just as much demonic distractions when you seek the word of the Lord. Beware of that. Don't and I don't pretend at all that I, I'm not weakly in this battle still. You know, sometimes failing, sometimes doing well. But, it, but recognize it is a battle. It's, it's, a, it's a daily battle. Am I going to get in the Word? Am I going to seek the Word and get in it? Or am I going to get distracted by sleep? As for me, sleep is probably the biggest you know, distraction slash sin that keeps me out of the Word. Just being being real with you guys. Um, could it be the computer? Could it be, for me, there was a long time that w whenever I sat down to get in the Word, images, pornographic images that, that I'd seen in, in the past, that'd be, whoa, what, where are these coming from? Used to having the same thing when, when we when I first started coming to the church when worship started and I'm trying to worship. Bang, bang, bang. That's that's the enemy. He's trying to get your mind off of off of the Lord. Get your mind off of seeking the Lord. And that, so that happens. What whatever that distraction is, whatever that thing is, be aware of it. Be aware of it. Fight against it. Be aware of it, fight against it. Verse 9, then Saul, who also is called Paul, so we see a transition here. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, we begin to see the transition from his, his Jewish name to his Greek name. Saul, Saul meaning something along the lines of the called one. Paul meaning something along the lines of little one. And so, not sure... Maybe a humbling going on here, but Paul or Paul's deciding to say, "I'm not, I'm not all that great. I'm just, I'm just a little guy here." And it's interesting as we go throughout Paul's ministry, he's he becomes the called one to the little one to I'm a sinner to I'm chief right near the end of his life. I'm the chief of sinners. This is, hold on, you should be you should be getting this under control near the end of your life. But, but the reality as we draw near to the Lord. Our sin becomes more apparent to us. It's, it may not be the, the external sins that, that everybody else sees, but we really become 
aware of the the internal heart sins that that um, and the positioning of our heart against the Lord and how it's very often at enmity with the Lord. So there's a transition here. Uh, one thing I wanted to Well, I think I missed something here I wanted to sh- point out. Nope, not yet. Okay, so we see a transition here as Saul, uh, Saul is taking on the name Paul. And for, for the most part, from here on out, he's, he goes by the name of Paul. Filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him. He's looking at Elymas. And said, O oh, fool of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, Will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? Think of that when you're distracted or or when something is coming between you seeking the word. Does this apply? O fool of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness. Not necessarily to yourself, but whatever the... Whatever the thing is that's distracting you, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by hand. Then the proconsul, the governor, believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. I think it's interesting as we as we watch the the proconsul become a believer here. We get to see the transition. He sought the word of the Lord. He sought the word of the Lord. He didn't seek signs, he didn't seek wonders. He didn't seek he sought the word of the Lord. Then there was a a sign and a wonder presented right to him, right in front of him. And it didn't say, ah, because of the sign, he believed. He said, it said, then the pro council believed. It tells us when it happened, when he saw that which had been done. But, it, but why is being astonished at the teachings of the Lord? He was astonished at the teachings of the Lord. It is, And the point being here is... Um, it's not signs and wonders that are going to save people. In fact, the Bible tells us that at the end times, people will begin to flock to signs and wonders. And we need to be careful that we are not those people who flock to signs and wonders. The signs and wonders will follow us. Those who seek the Lord, those who seek His Word, they will follow us, true signs and wonders. But we should be careful not to flock towards uh, signs and wonders a life lesson, seek the word of God and you will recognize the signs and wonders that are of God. Seek the word of God and you will recognize the signs and wonders that are of God. There will be signs and wonders that are demonic. And they'll look maybe just like um, the signs and wonders that are of the Lord. But they, they will be of a different spirit. And so we, we need to be grounded in the word of God to be able to discern that following the spirit seek the word of God and you will recognize the signs and wonders that are of God all right in verse 13 closing out here now when Paul and this party set sail for Paph- from Paphos. They came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. Now, if you look back in the, the early part of this, it was Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas, and here it becomes Paul and his party. See a transition here of leadership. Paul begins to uh, be be set apart as the leader of this party, and I don't think it's a. It is conjecture, but based on some other scripture, 
I think it may well be why John leaves them here, is that there's, John liked Barnabas. John, Barnabas is super encouraging. He was, he was you know, there, there was a, a closer relationship there. Um, we're, not, we're not given that detail here in this part of, Luke doesn't give us that detail in this part, but if you look forward to uh, Acts 15, Thirty-six. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now Barnabas was determined to, to take with them John called Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia. And had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren in the grace of God. And he went to Syria and Sicilia, strengthening the churches. So I think we, we get a little another little picture of, of maybe a contention that went on there with this with this transition. Maybe not, but... I think it's it's um, it's worth a warning at least that here a young believer is stirred up and torn by the fact that there's been a change in leadership or there's he doesn't you know something's happened there that that he doesn't seems that he maybe doesn't like this new leadership doesn't like something about about Paul there's Paul seems to have maybe held a bit of a grudge down down the road here and. In fifth, not a grudge. I'm not saying that's the right, the right term, but he's, yeah, I don't know that I want to do this. This guy, this guy bailed on us down the road. No, we're not. No, no, no. He, we're not going to try this again. Then we see that difference again between Paul and Barnabas. Barnabas is here. I'm, I'm going to help Mark. Obviously, Mark wrote the book of of Mark way later in life. Would he have ever done that if Barnabas hadn't come alongside him and picked him up when? When Paul was like, I'm done with you. So we see here again the grace of the grace of God using two vastly different personalities. That that their differences, they even bumped heads enough to split in this instance. And not so even in that, the grace of God was was great enough and the purpose of God was great enough that that John Mark was encouraged and restored in ministry. And Two, two missions were then formed out of this one mission. So it's a blessing to see um, the Lord, even in our faults, even in our uh, disunity, to, to, to use us sometimes. So the question was Paul wrong or was Barnabas wrong? I, I don't, we're, we don't, we can't stand here and necessarily say it was one wrong or was, we can see, we can see what was, what the end result was. We can see what God's plan was. Uh, but whether they're wrong or not, that's not really for us to say. Matthew Henry says, so Even those who are united to one and the same Jesus and sanctified by one and the same Spirit have different apprehensions, different opinions, different views, different sentiments, and points of prudence. It will, also, it will be so while we, while we are in this state of darkness and imperfection. We shall never be all of a mind till we come to heaven where light and love are perfect. And 1 Corinthians 13, 12, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but when face to face, now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am known. Right now, it is good for us to remember that we see things dimly. We do. We don't. We, we no matter how smart, how educated, how whatever we think we are, we see things dimly. And we see things only from our perspective. And we see things based on the understanding we have. And so allow that to help you to walk um, in grace towards other, in grace towards leadership, and grace towards one another when somebody else is doing something you don't think they should be doing. If it's, if it's outright sin, yeah, talk to them about it. 
in love. Restore, restore a brother in love. If it's a difference of opinion on how things should go, you could be wrong too. <laughs> Remember that. You see things dimly, just like they see things dimly. And the Lord could use both of your differences of opinion, both of your differences of, of personality to reach different people. And so walk in grace towards each other. Now there's truth. There's, I'm, not, I'm not debating. Truth is truth. And, and we shouldn't shy away from truth. Um, but there's a lot of things the Bible didn't necessarily, a lot of circumstances and decisions we find ourselves in daily that we can't go to chapter verse and say, oh, this is the right answer. We have to take principles and, and, and scriptures and, and pray and seek the Lord that they can be difficult decisions. And we, and we have, and we, uh, so, so le- let other people have that same freedom to seek the Lord and, and do as they feel the Lord has called them. Life lesson. We see things just from our perspective and understanding. If we humble ourselves, we can walk in grace towards others and serve those whom God has called to lead, even if we see things differently. Again, we see things just from our perspective and understanding. If we humble ourselves, we can walk in grace towards others and serve those whom God has called to lead, even if we see things differently. Remember that's us. Remember that for the most part. That's all, all, everybody in certain circles of their life, that's us. We should be an assistant, a good helper, rowing, rowing, rowing. Not, and that's, um, that doesn't mean that a, a captain can't call us up and ask us our opinion on something, <laughs> right? But our, but our job is, uh, let me just get, let me get the work done. Let me, let me get us moving so, so I can, uh, and the captain may be going left and then right and then left, right and right and right and right and going in circles. Um, that's okay. I'm just rowing right now. <laughs> My job to row. And ultimately, Jesus is our captain, right? Let's pray. Father, I thank you, God, for this. This picture of John Mark, um, Lord, who had some failure, had some success. Uh, God, you used him to write some of the Bible. God, I thank you God, for that picture of somebody who um, didn't always get it right, wasn't always strong and didn't always finish the job they started. But God, you brought a, a son of encouragement to lift him up. And you brought a, um, a man of strict truth, uh, Lord, who would correct him when he needed. And Lord, they all walked together and reached the world. And so I, I pray, God, that you help us, Lord, to walk together, Lord, to reach the world, and using the gifts and the and the positions and the roles, Lord, that you've given each of us, and not seeking a different one, but being faithful in the little things that you put in front of us. God, help us to honor you. Help us to lift up your son, Jesus, and to honor and seek after your word. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.